What is up my YouTube family? Welcome back to my channel. If this is your first time here, then it's just welcome to my channel and now welcome back. Go ahead and hit the subscribe button because you will not be disappointed. Y'all, I just got back from Cancun and I had a little piece of tan, girl, but I think it's gone. I think it left the building, so I have no evidence. I'm just gonna have to take my word for it. Y'all, today's story, I've been wanting to talk about this story for at least a year now because I started the notes like June of 2022. I was like, you know what? It's time. I don't know why I was struggling to find information um, back then, but I have finally gathered enough details to tell you the story. And uh, parents, y'all gonna have to help me out with this one. I'm not even gonna take up any more time in the beginning. Let's just get right into the details, okay? On September 6th of 2015, Zachary and his wife, Yvonne are sleeping deeply and peacefully inside of their Gwinnett County home right outside of Atlanta, Georgia, when they are suddenly awakened by two armed men who begin a brutal attack on them both. With the handle of a rifle, one of the men repeatedly hits Yvonne in the face and also strangles her while the other is stabbing her husband, Zachary, in the back. During the midst of the attack, Zachary manages to flee the bedroom and runs down to the garage while Yvonne also manages to make it away from the attacker and make it upstairs to a bedroom to dial 911. Morning, County 911. What's the location of your emergency? Yes, yeah, please send someone to my house, my children are trying to kill me. Now, as Yvonne is making this call and in an effort to, one, distract their sons and also signal for help, Zachary is trying to make it to the garage so he can beep the car horn. Yvonne informs dispatch that she and her husband own both a rifle and a pistol and she suspects that this is what her sons are using because she cannot find her pistol. When the dispatcher asked her what may have driven her sons to turn on them like this, Yvonne does not have an answer because she does not know. The only thing that she could think of as a possible reason behind this is them wanting to collect on an insurance policy. The entire 911 call is online. I believe you can find it on YouTube in its entirety. She remains on the line with them. Dispatch tells her to hide out in the bedroom that she's in until the police arrive. And as she goes to lock this bedroom, door she hears a lot of commotion coming from downstairs she can also hear her sons talking and in an effort to kind of scare them she yells out that she's called the police that they're on the way hoping that this will scare her sons off but unfortunately it does not police arrive to the home and the very first thing that they see is Zachary coming out of the garage and within seconds he collapses it is very obvious to them right away that he has suffered severe blunt force trauma. He and his wife both had, but Zachary's was a lot worse. Luckily though, they are both still alive, although Zachary is in critical condition. Their sons, 22-year-old Christopher and 17-year-old Cameron, are still in the house as well and they are immediately detained. And while they're there, police notice a very strong scent of gas inside of the home and notice that the gas line of the home had been tampered with. The brothers are charged with two counts of felony aggravated assault and two felony counts of first degree arson. And thus begins the investigation into the Urban family and what events had led up to this horrifying day. The father, Zachary Urban, was a star football player in college who was a sadist each time he and his wife learned that they were expecting a boy, one who could very possibly carry on his legacy. That was a dream of his, to have a son grow up and, you know, carry on the family name. Their upbringing was that of an average suburban family and Zachary is super proud when after high school Christopher goes to the University of Charleston in West Virginia on a football scholarship but knowing how much it means to his father for him to just be this great athlete and feeling like he had some pretty big shoes to fill this adds a lot of pressure to Christopher that paired with being a freshman away from home. He plays football, he carries a full load of classes, and he also works a part-time job for one whole year before he decides that the load is too much. Like this is not something he necessarily wants to do, more so something that he's doing to please his father. So he quits football and his father really resents him for this. Christopher then transfers to Valdosta State University, but unfortunately some of his credits don't transfer, which pushes back his 
graduation day. And without his football scholarship, he is also now trying to figure out how to afford his tuition. His financial stress pushes him to join the Air Force, which he thought would be a great saving grace for his financial situation. But just two months in, he is discharged when he fails a drug test. And so he returns to his parents' home yet again, and his father is again disappointed. He lets him know that he needs to get himself together and take his future a bit more seriously. And Zachary actually has a company, so he offers his son a job working as a forklift driver to make some money in the meantime, which he accepts. But again, him failing a drug test becomes an issue with that job as well. And to make matters worse, he has now totaled his car, which his father accuses him of being intoxicated in an accident. I didn't see a report official report that said that he was but around this time he was drinking in addition to smoking the devil's lettuce and so who knows after this accident he's really feeling low about his life and all of his recreational time is spent smoking drinking and taking xanax in excess he was really, really doing a lot. And when his parents find out about the pills, they are upset and they confront him about it. According to him, these substances that he is using is to help him cope through his days of feeling like a failure and feeling worthless. And he feels like he kind of needs them to make it through the day. But he also recognizes that it is something that is hindering him from doing his best. So it's like a catch-22. And as if that is not bad enough, he is also sharing his, his vices with his younger brother. The Cameron. And Cameron is still a minor. Now, Cameron is a very smart kid that wasn't really into sports that much, but he did attempt to play sports to please his father. He expresses interest in music and instruments, and his father makes fun of him for this. He teases him about it, and it's not something that he really approves of. When Cameron makes the decision to quit football and join the marching band, Zachary completely stops talking to him. He never supports him in anything band-related. He never shows up to any of the performances. He just has no interest whatsoever in band. Now Cameron was also a little bit fast, okay? He was always trying to sneak girls into the house and would stay out all night at times. And this is something he and his parents would argue about all the time. And then one day, Zachary notices $200 cash missing from his dresser. When he confronts the two of his sons about the missing money, both of them deny taking it. Zachary knows his wife didn't take the money. No one else has been in the house. It was in his bedroom, in his dresser drawer. So so in his eyes, it had to be one of his sons. He makes them each take a lie detector test and Cameron's shows deception. And this incident with the wallet and the money in the lie detector test doesn't leave Zachary upset and angry by himself. Both sons resent him for making them take a lie detector test. Even Cameron who looks like the one that took it. With everything that is going on, so much tension is building up inside the home. And most of the time, the children will be talking and the parents will be talking, but like they wouldn't be talking to each other kind of thing. And if they had anything to say to the children, they would text them instead of speaking to them directly. In one instance, Zachary tells one of the sons not to even look at him. Like it's, it's really bad. So this is the environment for months leading up to the attack. And in that time, also, the kids are basically feeling like it's a lost cause trying to please their father, that they're failures in his eyes. It just is what it is. And to cope with these feelings and emotions, they are using a lot of alcohol and a lot of drugs. Cameron is staying out all night doing God knows what. It is just, child, the household is a mess. The night before the attack, though, Christopher calls the parents and said that he and his brother want to make a dinner for the parents as an apology. This was very odd, something that neither of them had done before. And Vaughn thought it was a bit strange, but it sounds like a nice gesture nonetheless. And these are her children, so she agrees. She informs the father that the sons will be making them dinner and she looks forward to it. Fortunately for her and Zachary, dinner is not all that these two have up their sleeve. In addition to a nice home cooked meal, the sons serve the parents cocktails laced with Xanax and wait. After dinner, the parents go to a high school football game, but they leave early because all of a sudden they get really, really, really drowsy out of nowhere. They finally get tucked in. Christopher and Cameron light candles throughout the home and turn the gas up inside the home. Then the two of them sit outside and wait some more, hoping that any moment now their home would just blow up with their parents inside and it would all just look like an accident. Now, apparently something similar happened in a 
TV show that they really like called The Haves and the Have Nots. But um, unlike in the episode, nothing happens to their home. They wanted their parents to go peacefully and quietly, painlessly in their sleep. But if that is not an option, they do have a plan B, which they go to once they realize it is likely that their house is not going to ignite. They re-enter the home and both of them attempt to strangle one of their parents. Yvonne wakes up drowsily from her sleep to find a pillow pressed against her face and begins to fight back. And she's very confused when she realizes that it's her younger son, Cameron, trying to smother her. First with this pillow, then with the plastic bag, then with the plastic wrap. Like, he came in there with all these tools. She passes out briefly. But when she comes to, she realizes that the room is completely silent. She is all alone. Her husband is gone and her son. And while she is upstairs in that bedroom, she hears one of her sons ask the other, where is mom? When they find her on the phone with dispatch, they take it beat her some more and attempt to light her on fire and luckily for her seconds after this the police arrive in chris's interview with the police he tells them that he and his brother craved their parents approval which is something that they seemingly could not obtain nothing was ever enough and when bad things would happen like the car accident they would ask him why do all of these bad things happen to him and what has he done to bring all of this bad luck to himself and both brothers admit that they have been planning this for quite some time now. One of them actually said it, that they had been thinking about this since they were 11, but none of the articles that I found specified, even in an interview with the parents, they always say one of your sons was planning this since they were 11. And mind you, one is 22, one is 17. So either way, that's a long time. However, they both admit that they got to a place where they just wanted to start over fresh without their parents and figured that the explosion idea was great. It was a great way to do that. But once that plan failed, they figured that they had already started this so they had to finish it. Now initially they were going to stage a break in and do it that way. They figured that blowing up the whole place it would just be easier. And by the time they put out the fire and realized that two people were inside, they would have made it all the way to Tennessee, which is not that far. And no one would suspect that they had anything to do with it because they were not even in town. Just like his brother, Cameron is very eager to tell police about the issues that he and his brother had with their parents. And he tells them that he never felt like he belonged at home, which was part of the reason why he would always, you know, be trying to try to stay out late, not come home. He tells them that the night night before he had made them dinner how he had argued with his parents really bad he wanted to go out with his friends and they didn't want him to go out and have fun I guess and enjoy his little life from his point of view at that point he was just tired of them and everything that was going on and he and his brother decide to go ahead and set their plan in motion now more shocking than anything that we have discussed thus far is that a month after the attack Zachary and Yvonne appear on Good Morning America and refer to their son's actions as one bad moment they also revealed that Yvonne had written a letter to a Gwinnett County judge requesting the release of her son they also launch a nonprofit organization called Fighting for Forgiveness. They say that they now have personal insight into the world of depression and how detrimental it can be when it goes undetected and that God gave them the strength to forgive their son so that they could move on with his plans for their lives. And many people were completely shocked. A lot of people were torn. Most people felt like, girl, even if these are your kids, like how, how do you forgive them for this? Now, during their son's hearing, they both take the stand to ask for leniency, saying that their sons had apologized and had shown them true, genuine remorse, and both sons are redeemable. And they believe that their sons' battles with all these vices, depression, demons that they've now mastered, all of this fueled the attacks. And this wasn't actually, this wasn't them. She said that these are not the sons that she raised. Her sons would never do something like this. The father, he takes the stand and he echoes her sentiments. He says that that night in the house, he didn't see his sons. He saw Satan. He knew that what had happened to them was not his sons. And that is why he's able to stand with them and advocate for them because he knows that like that wasn't them. 10 other people, family, friends, church members, neighbors all come and speak on behalf of 
Christopher and Cameron, teachers, they all say the same thing, that the brothers were good kids from a good family and that they have no idea what could have led to these events. It completely caught them off guard. Yvonne also says that it is her belief that whatever they had ingested that night was impure, that it had been laced with something like a psychedelic that made them out of their minds. It says that this had to be given to them without their consent and is likely the cause of their actions. By the end of the hearing in which both brothers pleaded guilty to 13 counts, 13 different charges, the DA had suggested 30 years for each of them and their parents had requested the minimum they could get legally, which was 10 years. And Cameron and Christopher are both sentenced to 20 years in prison and then 30 years of probation after their release. Each of them got the opportunity to speak and they both apologized to the courts. They apologized again to their parents and expressed remorse. They also expressed how grateful they are for their parents' forgiveness and the fact that they had survived the attack and of each vowed to spend the rest of their lives making it up to their parents and showing God how grateful they are that he spared them, end quote. Their parents visit them each week and the younger brother said that these visits have really shown him how much they actually love him and made him realize how much he actually loves them as well. They will be 42 and 37 when they are released. And I want to know from everybody, whether you have a child or not, but I just want to know, like, do you think you could forgive your kid for this? Because I'm just feeling like with my childless self, no. Then I'm also a Scorpio. So I feel like they got a lot to do with it too. Like I could very well just see myself being like, girl, just pretend like you finished the job and act like I'm no longer here and stick into that. And maybe I'm wrong for that, but maybe that's my truth, baby. Judge me, but that's my truth. Who will lead you to believe he worked 16 hours? Y'all, I had a great time in Cancun. I came back with a good old tan, and now I'm doing the Dangles Fast. And if you're on Instagram, I stopped posting my meals because I was eating the same thing uh, every day. So it wasn't nothing new to post. But I'm still hanging in there. Today is the seventh day, and I feel great. <laughs> I'm making it. It's actually not that bad, honestly. Um, I'm literally only eating fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes. And that's it. Like, nothing processed unless it's minimally processed with just those ingredients. And I can season them up, but girl. Thursday's video, y'all, I'm so excited because... So I've had a couple of urban legends I wanted to make into all their own video, but they're not long enough. And I still feel like they're so interesting. I've always kept the notes from them. So I'm going to do like a urban legend beyond belief mashup where some of the urban legends will be like based on true events and some of them will just be urban legends that came out of nowhere. So like, you know, two birds, one stone kind of thing. I'm excited about the video. I'm filming that after this and I cannot wait. Let me know your thoughts down below on this video though. Like it before you leave, share it with a friend, or just share it with anybody, child. We're trying to grow the channel a little bit further, you know? Subscribe to the channel if you have not. As always, I appreciate you so much for spending your time with me, and I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Peace. <laughs> I can't even do the intro because I'm just laughing like a fool. <laughs> look at that. Blue back there on his little bed, curled up like a donut. Look at her. Don't bother him, bro. Don't do it. Christopher and almost got him Carmen in Atlanta. That's in Atlanta, right? I think so. Thanks. Bill is back there gnawing away at her little pig feet. Rush to the hospital right away. Brr. And most of the time, the, 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 when they finally took themselves in, okay, blue, really, really blue. And she's doing her best to fight back, but she loses consciousness for sure. She, she loses what? What does she lose? I feel like I got on two different people's eyebrows. This is crazy. Let me try to fix it. I'm not trying to make it worse. Okay, it didn't make it worse. Look at me. <laughs> and I say Satan. I can't say the T. Satan. That sounds so unnatural. That have been laced with something like a hallucinogen, a hallucinogen. You know how you try to say something and you picture the word, girl, I don't even know how that's spelled, so I couldn't even use phonics. That's crazy. Hallucinogen. I think that's it. So Cameron will be 42 when he's released, and Cameron. Did I, did I just say Cameron or did I say Christopher? I don't even know. 
they will be 42 and 39 if I can count when they're released. I can't count because that was 17 plus 20, 39. Oh, let me. Oh, look who it is. Anywho, I cannot wait to hear your thoughts down below. Okay. Uh.